Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center. My name is Ivan Salinas, and thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm the Poetry Coalition Fellow in Programs and Communication here at Beyond Baroque. Uh, but before we get started, I'd just like to make a few introductory remarks. We're an organization dedicated to the artistic possibilities of language by cultivating new writing, presenting contemporary literature and art, and building a diverse community of poets, writers, and artists. I'd like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism and genocidal practices. And as a literary arts organization, we're committed to uplifting indigenous communities, their stories and cultures. It's April, so uh, we're celebrating National Poetry Month. I think it's a favorite time of the year for a lot of us. Uh, <laughs> uh, and tomorrow we'll be having a poetry and abolition reading celebrating Christopher Soto's book launch, Diaries of a Terrorist, um, there's a wonderful lineup of writers there with Miriam Gerba, Vanessa Angelica Villarreal, Tommy Pico, and many more prominent authors. So do come out to that and, and spread the word. Um, we're publicizing everything on our social media platforms. Uh, we have a full slate of programs coming up, including in April 22, we'll be hosting LA Poet Laureate Lynn Thompson and author Nikki Beer for a reading. And on April 30th, we're also having our first ever International Poetry Film Festival. So we'll be announcing that on our platforms this week. Um, also keep an eye out for our virtual programs. Uh, this month we're hosting the second installment of Poets Translate Poets, featuring poet translators of the Latin American avant-garde, as well as our free Monday night fiction workshops and Wednesday night poetry workshops. Um, but tonight, most of all, support our authors tonight by purchasing their books. Uh, they'll be available following the reading in our, in our bookstore, and there'll be a lovely reception put on together by our anfitrionas tonight. We also offer memberships, um, which really help us in continuing our free programming. So consider becoming a member. Um, it is as little as $25 and up, but you will be really supporting Beyond Baroque and all the authors that we bring into the space. And also thank you to poets and writers for supporting us with a grant and make this event possible. Thank you to the work of Ms. Beth Um Tonight's event features six wonderful poets committed to creating spaces for art in their communities across Los Angeles. But I won't be saying too much about that as we have a wonderful amphitriona tonight taking care of that, which I have the honor of introducing. Um, please let's give a warm, Welcome, after I read her bio, uh, Lisbeth Coyman is a bilingual poet and educator and a native Spanish speaker. She has a master's in education and over 25 years experience teaching both English as a second language and Spanish to children and adults in different settings. Her debut book, I Asked the Blue Huron, a memoir, narrates her immigration journey. Her first bilingual poetry collection, Uprising, Al Samiento, published by Finishing Line Press in 2021, brings attention to the unprecedented humanitarian crisis in her homeland. An avid reader, Coleman enjoys writing book reviews for the New York Journal of Books. She's an active member of several writing communities, including Women Who Submit, the Community Literature Initiative, and the Wayward Writers. In her free time, Coleman dances salsa and hikes the trails in and around Los Angeles. So let us la bienvenida a Lisbeth Coleman. Thank you all for coming today. Um, I wanted to to do this event uh, to in in the in the framework of the of the April Poetry Month because I wanted to honor those people who have pave a, the way not only for me, but for many others to be out in the community, getting our feet wet, getting our, our names out. Um, when you start without a community at all, like I started here completely alone in Los Angeles, 
are women like these are the people who have opened their doors and have introduced me to all of you without them i would not know you and um so i um the event tonight is going to have two parts we're going to start with a reading i'm going to introduce each reader and they will read for three four minutes each and then the next and then the next and then after the reading we're going to have a panel where we're going to discuss some uh, issues in the community um the one thing that brings us all together it's that we are all latinx we all speak spanish and uh, these all these ladies are community builders they not only are writers or poets two, two are not poets but just writers not poets <laughs> <laughs> and um but they also they they what attracted me to them what i see in them as leaders is the, their capacity to build community and and stick to their community i frequent uh, the rap saloon since i came here and it's it's a community it's like it's 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 distinct it's unique and when you go to libro mobile you have a unique community that it's it's so part of santa ana's life and when you when you visit a, or you go to any of the readings for a, a sponsored by a, the LA Poetry Society, you see the valley in the community and Alegria um, Davina when she invites a readings and she gets her little a little van going around the neighborhoods you you hear the spanish and you see that it's a unique community too and the same with lucy in long beach you have a, a gathering people of color and a bilingual people of color in the in the community in Long Beach. So each one of them has something unique to give, but what ties us all together is that we are all Latinx and that we are all we were, we are all bilingual. So with that, I'm gonna start with a Sara. I'm gonna read her bio because I cannot memorize anything anymore. I think COVID affected that part of the brain that 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 had memory and the ability to wear stilettos. So that <laughs> <laughs> um, Sara Rafael Garcia is an author, a community educator, and performance ethnographer. As a child of immigrants and first generation graduate, she has over 15 years of experience as an arts leader in the Orange County. She is the founder of Barrio Writers, Libro Mobile in 2016, and Crear Studio. All our programs initiated as a response to building cultural relevance and equity for bilingual people of color folks in her community. As of 2020, her community projects collectively established the Libro Mobile's art cooperative, LMAC. She's the author of Las Niñas, Santana's Fairy Tales, and co editor of Parayas and Speculative Fictions for Dreamers. Her poetry, essays, and fiction have been a have appeared in various publications. Garcia has received numerous awards and fellowships, the latest of which is the 2021 Arcus Fellow, isn't it? Garcia credit to her parents, GED education, and the migrant labor that brought her grandparents to the United States as a source of perseverance and foundation to her accomplishments. Please welcome Sara Garcia. <laughs> Sara Rafael Garcia. I always have to remind people that I started as a poet and I became very long-winded. And then I realized there's people that are doing it much better than I am. So I switched to prose. Um, but I do admire poets greatly and, and they inspire me to write. So my largest collection of books is poetry. 
So I'm going to read you something that I rarely get to read. And I know Lucy's going to enjoy this because we came out of a food writing workshop. Um, but it's from a publication through Eater. And I had it published in English and Spanish as a special collection for mis abuelitas because, you know, they don't read English. So oftentimes I get called out by them when I publish something. <laughs> and they say, what am I going to do with this? It's in English. Um, so I made sure that this one was available to them because it's uh, about them. And it's titled... When I had to give up flour tortillas, I lost my culture. Um, and I'm just gonna read an excerpt. And I tried, I, I, you know, I invoked my poetry gods to help me make it really short for y'all. Um, so here it goes. When I'm desperate, I heat up a rice tortilla on the comal. You know, the kind, the kind found at alternative grocery stores, organic, without a trace of GMO corn and unsatisfyingly gluten-free. Nothing like homemade tortillas or tortillas from the local Mexican market. While warming up these rice imposters, I still use my fingers to flip them because that's what my abuelas taught me. Once as a teen, I tried to use a spatula to avoid burning my fingers. Mi abuelita Cata smacked my hand with it and reminded me that Mexican women don't flip tortillas with anything but our bare hands. <laughs> I stopped eating flour tortillas in, or I stopped eating flour in 2012 at the age of 38. After one week of what I thought was the stomach flu and a patch of oozing blisters on my chin, a doctor informed me that my symptoms seemed to be caused by a digestive issue and stress. When I suddenly realized what gluten-free really meant, no more flour tortillas, I was devastated. Up until then, my favorite way to eat a flour tortilla was to wait for a generous amount of butter to melt and pull in the center. Sometimes I added the butter while the tortilla heated on the comal. Once the butter melted, I'd use my fingers to gently rip it apart, the edges, and dip each bite into the puddle. I repeat the process over and over, making my way to the center until that last bite, which was used to wipe down the remaining butter off the plate. I then completed the event by licking the butter off my fingers. This is what mis abuelitas taught me. Savor each bite. As a child, eating Abuelita Maria Luisa's flour tortillas was a different experience from eating those of my maternal grandmother, Abuela Cata, whose tortillas came to represent the chaos, resilience, and unity of family time. Abuelita Maria Luisa taught me to appreciate solitude. Each bite, each bite was a moment just with her, especially in the early mornings of the day, she would give me the first tortilla covered in a melt and melted butter. During such moments, she shared countless stories of her life. Before migrating to the US with my grandfather, she lived in a home with dirt floors. She was expected to keep them clean and pat it down with water to emulate cement. Once in the US, she was expected to play a domestic role for her husband and six children. Yet in the kitchen, she got to be the head of the house even if it only lasted until the last bite of the meal. I once asked Abuelita Maria Luisa why she accepted my grandfather's machismo. She raised an eyebrow and looked at me straight in the eyes and said, A ver, dime que tipo de vida tuviera si yo no me quedaba con tu abuelito. Her sentiment was similar to the comments my own mother made after my father's passing, and both reminded me that my life was made from the lives they didn't get to choose. It was through Abuelita Maria Luisa's words that I came to understand that she chose to succeed in her domestic role in order for me to choose my own role in life, including the option to prioritize my health over cultural expectations. Now I have to count the starch I eat per day. And I get angry whenever I see people who have the fortune of being able to eat flour tortillas turn down the opportunity. 
Both of mis abuelitas are in their 80s, living in their respective homes in Texas. Both survived major surgeries. One had a stomach tumor the size of a melon, the other a brain tumor the size of a man's fist. Abuelita Cata recently endured knee surgery and has difficulty standing for long periods of time. Abuelita Maria Luisa is limited by a wheelchair and a few years ago, she lost full movement of her arms. These days, they both spend less time in the kitchen. Yet, it is both of mis abuelitas who shaped through how they approach making their incomparable flour tortillas, how I approach my own womanhood. In my way, I am a product of their lives. I know it is their rituals that gave me permission to create my own, whether I eat flour tortillas or not. Mm. I wanna eat flour tortillas, but homemade right away. Oh my goodness. You Good. made me Good hungry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I said before that I lost the ability to wear stilettos, but I also, I'm also gained the ability to deface. I'm changing face from solid to liquid. So if I become a puddle, know that <laughs> the heat is doing its work. <laughs> I'm hot for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> And the hormones, one of them. <laughs> Lucy Rodriguez Hanley is a Dominican American nonfiction writer and filmmaker. Her work is featured in Gathering, a women who submit anthology, and is forthcoming in the Washington Heights Memoir Project and Harper's Via Somewhere We Are Human Authentic Voices on Migration, Survival, and New Beginnings, edited by Reina Grande and Sonia Guignanazaca. And she also was published recently in LA, Stories of LA, Made in LA, Made in LA. Mm -hmm. Lucy is the chapter's liaison for women who submit <laughs> and leads the Long Beach chapter of the organization. You can learn about her in www.lucyrodriguezhanley.com. She has become a dear friend and a great ally. And uh, it was her wise words that helped me through, the, through my divorce. Get a lawyer, mija. <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, I'm always advocating for women. And I do remember we bonded over. Uh, it was a, a women who submit meeting that she hosted at her beautiful home in uh, Palos Verdes. <laughs> and she's, she, I'm like, oh no, you need. You, Get a lawyer, me. <laughs> um, so thank you, Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> I didn't know her, but I just, <laughs> that was my first time meeting her. Um, so this piece is um, titled, Your Body is a Battleground. And um, it was published in a Mother's Day anthology last, uh, last year by the Latinx Project at NYU. Um, your body is a battleground. Do you want to know the gender? Dr. B, my OBGYN asked over the phone. I was certain I was carrying a boy. The results of the non-invasive prenatal test were supposed to take two weeks to process. I had not ha had a bout of anticipatory anxiety, dreading the worst case scenario of the genetic probabilities that came with a geriatric pregnancy. Less than a week later, I got a call from Dr. B while I watched The Hunting Ground, a documentary about the rape epidemic on college campuses in the United States. I rubbed my belly comforted by the thought that it was going to be easier to raise a feminist son than a daughter who would not get raped. I breathed a sigh of relief when she said all chromosomes were normal and there were no trisomies. After two miscarriages and three failed IVF cycles, it looked like IVF number five was going to work. When Dr. B said I was, carry, I was having a girl, my heart sank. We spent a small fortune on pre-implantation genetic testing 
prior to the fourth IVF cycle. I wanted a daughter. That was the reason we put in an excellent male embryo and a fair female embryo instead of two excellent male embryos the reproductive endocrinologist suggested. A girl will give you horrible morning sickness to prepare you for the heartache she will cause you, mommy said to my sister Sonja when she was pregnant with my niece. A girl won't let you look pretty when you're pregnant because she's already stealing your beauty. That's why you don't look too cute, my sister-in-law told my sister Ona when she was pregnant with my other niece. I had no morning sickness and plenty of pregnancy low. I bought into the Dominican myth passed around by the women in my family and convinced myself I was having a boy. From the moment I found out I was having a daughter, I worried. How will I protect her? How will I protect my girl from the patriarchy that will disregard her no? How will I protect her from men who make decisions about her ovaries because her body, as artist Barbara Kruger stated, is a battleground. When the reproductive endocrinologist suggested we transfer two A plus male embryos because they had the highest chance to implant, my husband and I agreed. But IVF number four resulted in a miscarriage so bloody, I had to reupholster the light taupe driver's seat of my car. When I decided that the fifth round of IVF was going to be my last, I dismissed my doctor's opinion. The science was flawed and favored the boy embryos. I chose to transfer a boy and a girl. But when I got a positive pregnancy test, my unconscious bias took over and incorrectly assumed the boy implanted. I was already failing, failing her by assumption. Dismantling the patriarchy had to start with me. I had to rise above the internalized traumas and prejudices to be able to mother my daughter. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Wow. That must, I, I, always, I always wonder would have, what would have been if I had a daughter. I, I'm a mother of men, so I, I, do, I always wonder, must have been a different experience as a mother. Cynthia Alessandra Briano is very close to my heart. She's the director of Rap Saloon Reading Series since February 2016 and founder of Love On Demand Global. She's the daughter of Mexican immigrants and grew up in Southeast LA. She left home at 14 to attend boarding school in Massachusetts. Cynthia earned a BA from Swarthmore College in, did I say that right? Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania and a master's in fine arts in poetry from the University of California at Riverside. Cynthia teaches at Cal State Fullerton in the African-American Studies Department as part of the Ethnic Studies Program. She has been the recipient of the Lloyd, the Lloyd Morrill and J. Russell Hayes Poetry Prize and finalist in the James Hart's Poetry Prize. You can connect with her at Cynthia Briano at Rap Saloon. She hosts the Rap Saloon reading series on first Fridays and Elena Scott runs it on the third Fridays. The Rap Saloon takes place in the oldest building in Santa Monica, which was built in 1875. She's a great salsa and bachata dancer. <laughs> and is a party girl and a nerd. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lizbeth. Thank you so much to the staff at Beyond Baroque and thank you poets and writers for sponsoring this event. Thank you also for um, these incredible Latinx um, uh, writers and community organizers for sharing their, their work, their stories. I'm super excited to be here. I too am learning how to balance again on stilettos. So thanks for <laughs> that shout out. Um, I'd like to share a poem with you that I wrote specifically at the beginning of the pandemic, at the height of lockdown, in response to um, what something I learned about uh, 
about uh, the Florentine Codex, which is a compendium of Aztec culture that we have from the sixth century. And um, for many centuries, it has been credited to Friar, Sa uh, Friar Bernardino de Sahagún. Um, and it also credited so-called collaborators, uh, uh, which were, it's credited Aztec scribes, which are referred to by different things such as collaborators or aides. Um, but uh, over the last several years, there has been research to uncover their names. And now we know the names of several of those Aztec scribes who were the first generation to learn the Roman alphabet. And uh, they were also some of the first generation to learn, uh, to attend a, a uh, European college and learn Greek and Latin. And so um, they compiled some of this work to, to document their cultural history during one of the, um, one of several of the uh, quarantine periods that they went through because of encounters, um, encounters with diseases. So this is a response to uh, learning about that and thinking about one of the earliest, um, the first generation of um, bilingual poets and scribes. It's called Tlaquila, which means Aztec scribe. I'll read a section of it. Codex, codices, index, indices, smallpox and depopulation brought by Narvaez, Huitlawa dies of the Valley of Mexico in Tenochtitlan, pathology, Spanish allies killed by, see also disease, disease and leadership and new world population. See also smallpox, list of maps, Nahua pronunciation guide, short chronology of the conquest, brief sketches of the participants, Florentine Codex, Sahagún Bernardino de, Codex Mendoza, diseases, natives susceptibility to. I am the scribe that is held hostage. It is only one generation into colonization. I can still speak Nahua. I have learned Spanish too and Latin. I can ask my elders. They are outside, exposed to the disease. I am in quarantine. It is the 16th century. I have had what passes for an elite education. You have taught me your language so I can translate it into mine and convert them to yours. You are suspicious that we only pretend to believe that we're still us in another form. Only the words can do the work. Viruela, ciruela, bisabuela, tachuela, sarampión, campeón, población, I count the days of exposure and infection. I compare the timelines the way I've seen. Mexico 1519, day one exposure. But I am not an epidemiologist. I'm probably counting wrong, telling it wrong, or comparing the wrong things. Still, I draw lines up against what my mind keeps pairing. If I accept this pairing, I must ask, where will this pairing take me? Vislumbrar, to catch a glimpse of, to be faintly visible, to know imperfectly. Vislumbre, glimmer, indication, to perceive a thing without seeing it clearly. Plaga, plague, calamity. My parents and all my uncles have a round scar on their upper arm right below their left shoulder where the skin is depressed. Donde me vacunaron, they say. I only looked up today which vaccine it was. If you have this scar on your arm and you got it in Mexico before 1970, it was for smallpox. This is the only way I can do it. 
arrange the items that walk together in my understanding. It's not an addition problem or one of logic. In debate, logic is what must be true. This is the only inheritance, the only markings on our body. The scars are the proof. And we try to work the experiment in reverse. That is how my understanding is. The only understanding is what I can touch, the scar on my father's shoulder, the count of the things I can count. Two emperor successions in eight months because they died from the disease, no one with experience to lead the defense of your empire. And don't think I know about Mexican history. We're not raised in the US to know it. The few paragraphs in the textbook saying depopulation instead of pueblo, estimate instead of story. I quarantine, I read, I ask my elders. That is my work. I transcribe into written form memory they have carried. I can't encompass it all. The world takes me inward. It can only happen through my hands. Grief is laborious. I have done its labor. Now I come to you with the work of my words. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Cynthia always leaves us with some ruminations in our, in our minds. Jessica Wilson Cardenas. <laughs> I want to, in my mind, she's unique, but I always see her with her, with her duo, the dynamic duo, and her the two little, the two little rascals that go behind her all the time. She's a Chicana poet born in East Los Angeles, California. She's the third generation beatnik, a beat poet from the lines of Jack Spicer to Paul Vangelisti and the heartbeat of the visual muse and master poet Mauria Simon. She completed her BA in creative writing and art history from UC Riverside in Riverside, California. Oh, they are your fellow Riversadians. <laughs> I just invented a new word. <laughs> <laughs> and she obtained her master's of fine art from Otis College of Art and Design in Los Angeles, California. In 2009, she founded the Los Angeles Poet Society. And that's how I know her. And began a network of literary events and open mics such as the Writers' Row. The, DT, the downtown Los Angeles art work showcase of the written art, soapbox poets open mic, uh, the salon at NoHo, North Hollywood, right? A gallery 19, LA Poet Society presents on full spectrum, Writer Wednesday, and there is Ptolemy, Tolo something? Oh, Tonali. Tonali. It's not here. <laughs> Stonali as well. Um, and one thing I can say about the events and the different uh, shows that uh, Jessica organizes this is that she's extremely generous with her time, uh, the, the time she gives to people to read. And so if you go to one of those events, you know you're going to sit there and listen to all sorts of different styles and, and topics and things because she just cannot give enough of herself to, to these people. Uh, Los Angeles Poet Society is 13 years old and was founded in Venice. Beyond Baroque is the fiscal sponsor uh, since 2017. Um, LA Poet Society Press began in 2020 as a call to humanity to bear witness to the affair that we were living through. And um, a Wilson Cardenas Literary Network Services, the LA County and beyond the LA Poetry Society, first action was, and beyond, sorry, the first action was to the soap open mic and which started in November 29, 2009 and at the Venice, Venice Beach board, uh, boardwalk where everyone passing by 
was offered a chance to step on the box and share their truth. I can only imagine how was that in Venice with all that going on, right? <laughs> she teaches poetry in California Poets in School, the oldest nonprofit dedicated to empowerment of youth in California. Jessica is also a current uh, or currently an English teacher for Los Angeles Unified School District. Her books of poetry include What Breathe, Raw Kid, Mary Morrison, and most recently, Serious Longing, published by Swan World Press in Paris, France. So she's also an international poet. Please welcome Woo! Jessica Wilson. Hi, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much, Lizbeth. I wasn't expecting all that and all that. Uh, thank you. Um, hello, Beyond Baroque. Hello, everyone. So uh, it's just wonderful to be here back home where my roots uh, feels good. And also what an honor to be on this uh, event and this panel, these wonderful, amazing uh, women and, and just humans, amazing humans. So um, I just do want to take a moment of my time to make a, a land acknowledgement and just to acknowledge all those who, uh, you know, occupy these lands and continue. They are in here. They're still. They're still life, <laughs> and all of their their descendants. You know, and we all come from indigenous blood, right? So, just want to acknowledge those uh, the to the Tongva, the Chumash, uh, the Thalium, the Fernandeño, and all indigenous. Omotel, blessings, and thank you for having me here. Um, I just wanted to share um, a few, well, I had two poems. I hope that, I think it'll work for the, the, the four minutes. Um, but this um, is uh, one of our LA Poet Society Press books, an anthology called Los Angeles Poets for Justice, a document for the people, which in quarantine has, the, oh, the quarantine poem was awesome, oh my gosh. But just not being able to use our, well, for me as an activist, not being able to use my voice or amplify my voice or be out in the streets and protest and speak out on what happened to George Floyd and what continue, continues to happen to people of color. Um, I had the call to action to everyone to bear witness and share their truth and share whatever they're thinking based on um, uh, what happened to George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd. Um, so it's a very uh, powerful anthology um, that I'm proud of and, and um, just honored to continue the work. And um, through this, uh, this was, this is a beginning, you know, this is a beginning of, of movement and it carries all of our words and makes us louder and really, I believe, um, enables us to make real change. Um, our words, our art will live on forever, right? How do we still know William Shakespeare? How do we still know uh, Homer, right? Immortals, right? So this will live beyond my time. This is called The Invasion, and I dedicate this to Andy Lopez and Melanie Corrado. Why not say anything? Why not do anything? Why not make a move to improve the way you see me? Brown skin capturing light, eyes brown like the roots of Mother Earth, into my mother, into my grandfather's, into my land. Yes, this is our land. You extended yourself overseas to join us on Turtle Island, the land occupied by red, black, and brown bodies. Totems in the air made to honor our senses, our connection to the gods that bring us wind, rain, fire, clouds, ocean song, balance and fertility of the cycles that exist to create us. You make us try so hard to breathe through your tyranny, to be able to exist freely, playfully, spirit of life that smiles to greet existence. But you came here to conquer, silence all other bodies or wrongfully bed them to make them yours. Our bodies do not belong to you. We do not need to silence our skin because your eyes cannot stand to hold the blessing of the sun upon our cuerpos. We glow because we belong to the earth. 
We glow because our life pulsates to the song of our skin, vibrations, humming, beauty. It's where we belong. We will gladly share earth with you if you mute your inclination to kill us. Dedicated, dedicated to Andy Lopez, who was murdered by police in Santa Rosa in 2013 for carrying a toy gun. He was 13 years old. Meli Corrado was murdered by police in Los Angeles, California in 2018 in a crossfire between police and a suspect while she was working inside Trader Joe's. Emeli Corrado was my friend and a deep, deep friend of my family. My husband and his sister's best friend and roommate. So, you know, Omateo is dedicated to them. And um, again, just so proud that we can come together and stand together and be the voice for justice and truth and recognize patterns and be that voice for change and really take action. Um, I feel like things, you know, as we band together, it's getting, it, we're, we're improving things. We really are. Um, and this is a poem called This Face. This face evolves into you from me to you and before. It shows the path of each choice that led to love, to blunder, to sex, to reform, to reframe, to reconsider. It's the face of an era run over by men and the many bad apples they carry and turn over in their sacks. It's the face of an army that persuaded and then attacked. It's the face of a man blistered, bathed in swords. It's the face of a womb with shotgun arms held feet beyond her shadow. It's the emblem of the conquest and the conquered. It's the map of luxury that costs many lives. Cattle pleading, goats bleeding, a carnage of chickens fleecing coops. It's the face of sun thickened desert sings, the face of chiseled bronze, nourished alms, the snakes, thorny cactus that bled too much, the taste of sweet nipples dripping like blades, delicate hand to keep you pumping hard for another life, another chance, another seed to tend and grow and bend for another lifetime assured to glow for them and I dedicated to all the women and the lineage of my ancestors. Thank you so much. And we get to our last reader, Davina Ferreira. I met Davina at the Community Literature Initiative. We took classes together and we instantly connected because we are neighbors at heart. It's a Colombian and I'm a Venezuelan. And as soon as we heard each other's accent, so we knew we were going to be friends. <laughs> Davina was born in Miami, but grew up in Colombia. She is the quintessential symbol of the immigrant's American dream. Upon arriving in the US, Ferreira attended college, receiving a BA in fine arts at UC Irvine, and worked as an actor uh, with the Bilingual Foundation of the Arts. Later on, she attended the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London, RADA, to pursue classical acting. Ferreira then completed a journalism certificate at UCLA Extension and began a career in journalism, which led her to launch Alegria Magazine. Alegria Magazine is now 10 years old. She then wrote her first book, Take Me With You, Llévame Contigo, a bilingual compilation of short stories and poems of love. Her book, Finding My Alegria, is an inspirational memoir which she hopes will motivate young entrepreneurs around the world to pursue their dreams regardless of their circumstances. If Love Had, Love had a Name is her first poetry collection in English, winner of the Juan Herrera Best Poetry Book Award at the International Latino Book Festival. Her latest book, Libre, is a micro poetry collection in Spanish. Davina is the founder and driving force behind the Young Alegría 
publishing company, which is two years old and has already published 29 titles. Please welcome and Davina. Thank you so much for this beautiful invite. Thank you to everyone who made this possible. Well, I've been in Los Angeles for 22 years. Um, like you mentioned, I come, all my family is from Medellin. And as a young theater actress and also as a journalist working in Spanish television here, there was something always with my accent, right? People are always telling me to reduce my accent, to maybe speak in a, with a Mexican accent, you know, for Spanish television and all of that. So when I worked on my first um, poetry collection in English uh, through the CLI, where we met, I wanted to create a poem dedicated to my accent because after being here <laughs> for 22 years and getting older, my accent is actually such a beautiful reminder where I come from and one of the only things I have left at this point from my heritage. So this poem is titled My Accent. My accent is my song, my accent is my song. Mi acento es una canción, mi acento es mi canción. My accent is a song that can make you sway, dance, or laugh. Let me tell you about my pride, Colombian American. Spanish from Medellin and English from my Californian dreams. My accent is a song which reminds me every day where I come from. This is strong accent, sweet, enticing, slow, and sometimes phonetically wrong, but it lets my heritage crawl back on my soul and I don't want to let it go. Call it nostalgia of lost loves, of ancestral memories long gone, of grandmothers, orchids scent, and green mangoes under the sun. My accent is a song that can make you undressed and calm your nerves, a cadence of songs played long ago, melodies of days forever gone by that come back to me today and remind me de donde vengo yo. But don't be deceived, I did go to school and I may even write a little better than you. <laughs> And though I look fair, I carry within me the Amazon and the Conquistador, the tortured and the executioner, I carry them all. Indigenous in my love of nature, native and wild as a rare flower. The African in me loosens her hips when she listens to that salsa beat. And the Portuguese reminds me of my grandfather I'm still to meet. Remembrance of times long forgotten, a consciousness to transcend what was done before, as I seek to return one day to my essential truthful wholeness. My accent is my song, and it reminds me every day de donde vengo yo. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm going to pull a seat because the stilettos are not going to give me a break tonight. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to wrap up the, the reading session with two brief poems of mine. Um, one is from my um, poetry collection, Uprising Alzamiento. And it speaks to what we are here today. Banyan Grove, South Coast Botanical Garden, Palos Verdes Peninsula, LA County. The massive Morton Bay fig tree stands at the center of this man-made system of superficial roots, growing fast, robust, displaced in a foreign land. Each tree holds its place, contained within the boundaries of the ropes 
around them, like us so far away from the shade of the forest, always uncomfortable, mark streets limiting our expansion, yet we hold each other and try. And when we fight injustice, when we fight um, torture and um, even vaccination in, in by regimes, all we have to do, all we have, all our weapons, our words. And if the coroner will come tonight to tell what happened to my body, this is what my body will say. If I fall silent today, my hair will weave verses in silver wool. Ellipses will flood my eyes, run down the cobble streets of my face, while question marks like ornaments will dangle from my ears, attentive to the silences of others. My tongue will edit the past mistakes of my actions. The scar on my face will spell agony in all caps. Bolded letters will grow from the tips of my fingers. The freckles on my back will tell impossible stories of the land located right under my eyelids. The keloid on my navel will zipper the wounds of birth with suture screams. The, the sweat under my breast and armpits will draw descriptions of the solitary roadside trances without making a ruckus, like run-on sentences in the social distances between us. My knees, my knees will write prayers with thick chalk sticks on the sidewalk, punctuate them with each deformed pore of my skin. If I fall silent today, my body will speak for me. I'm very proud of that poem because that poem was born in a in a Saturday night check a Saturday morning check-in with women who submit during the pandemic. And it was given a prompt and I just wrote it in 15, less than 15 minutes. And, and now it's becoming one of my signature poems. So we reached the part of the of the of the uh, the the event where we're going to have a conversation and that's why we are here today for um i hope you have enjoyed the reading as much as i hope you're going to enjoy us talking <laughs> um i don't expect to ask all the questions that i have but i will try <laughs> So the first question, and anybody can answer in any order. You can jump in, cut each other, fight for the mic, do whatever you want. I don't have any rules because if I regulate too much, then it's going to sound like um, we're giving a lecture. And the idea is to have a conversation like comadres in the room. Okay. So what, what motivated you to start what you started? To join, to get the Rap Saloon or to a Star Libro Mobile or to a Star uh, LA Poet Society. What is the driving force be to, be, behind what you initiated that is becoming your signature? That's what's making you known in the community. Anybody can jump in. I'm sorry. <laughs> so for me, Alegria Magazine was born out of my desire and the need that I saw for stories that were inspiring about our community, like living here for so many years. Um, as we know, the conversation about immigrants and people coming from other countries was always in the news for the wrong reasons. And in my experience, I was always running into very inspiring people from Latin America or, you know, Latinx people living here, you know? 
And for me, it's like, what happens if we share these stories that are inspiring, that really are showing leaders in our community? And also, I wanted to, to change the format. You know, we're talking about 10 years ago when print still was, you know, very relevant before, you know, Instagram and all of that had just started. And I also wanted to create it in a format that I felt pay tribute and respect to our culture because everything that I saw in media in print um, either was spell, you know, the, the grammar, everything was just like, oh, we don't care about the Spanish language mm -hmm. or, you know, and, and, and the paper and the quality was very low. So I wanted to create what if I create a magazine that pays tribute to our culture in a beautiful upscale way that is like a luxury type of magazine that you find in mainstream. And from there, you know, um, obviously all these other things that, that I created have come from kind of honoring um, our culture from a place that I see was still like, obviously there is a lot of powerful women and people doing beautiful work paving the way, but also we, in a way, just starting too. There's so much to do. Um, so when I created um, this mobile bookstore, that is literally, I went and found a, a van um, in the valley and then I literally wrapped it and my husband was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, it's going to be a mobile bookstore to share the beauty of Latin American literature. He's like, oh my God, here we go again. Um, so yeah, this band really started also from my love and passion for literature and maybe sharing with other people growing up here, you know, some of the literature I grew up in Colombia reading, right? Um, and it just became this beautiful project where like a lot of people have resonated with it and we go to different neighborhoods, teach creative writing workshops, do different reading programs for both children and adults and, and it's been just so wonderful. Um, so I think all of this is just out of my passion and love for my community. Great, great. And, and that leads me to, to Sarah because, the, because of the idea of mobile uh, libraries, right? So it is, it's a similar concept, although they are very different. It, 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 she actually has a van moving around. <laughs> and, and, and the, the Libro Mobile is a, is a small life. It started as a small bookstore and now it's growing. It's, it's yeah, different. it actually started as a small push cart. Uh -huh. uh, uh, gardening uh, carts, because, I, yeah. you know, Santana, as you, most of you might know, is 80% Latinx with a large undocumented population and uh, increasingly high rents. Um, so we're constantly fighting displacement and gentrification and housing issues. Um, and so the reason I started Libro Mobile initially was because I was able to come go back home to where I grew up in 2016 with an artist in residence. And the first thing I felt was guilt because why me? Why do I get to come back with support from the arts, right? And, and not anybody that actually still lives in the city. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the projects that came about was Libro Mobile as a you know, an extension of why I was able to move back, but it wasn't the project that got me my residency. Santana's fairy tales did that. But the idea was because I came home and so many things had changed, including our only bookstore, Libria Martinez, had closed mm -hmm. a year prior. Um, and that was, a, a, you know, a, a, a bookstore that had been around since the 80s. But it was because of being priced out um, and from rents and finding constantly moving and not being able to own a, a property. So the first thing I said is I don't want to pay rent and I can't afford any, any other way. So when my friend gave me a gardening cart because I lived in an apartment and had no gardening and I have food issues, obviously, um, I, she says, here, you can grow your own garden and vegetables. And I said, or I can plant books. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I literally started out of a gardening cart. And the idea was to roll it around town. But again, like issues with city policy and, and um, controlling the Latinx immigrant community, mm -hmm. you can't sell things on the street. Um, you will get cited. They allow you to sell food, but you can't sell books. Um, Go figure. I would get ticketed <laughs> if I did. Um, so then I started finding alternative ways to pop up. And so the idea was to um, find different ways to be able to be on the street with books and you know, even have a bike trailer. So I did a bike trailer 
uh, or a few events, but you know, the city is also not bike friendly. It is getting better, but it's not, people were not happy you know, when I was showing uh, books. Um, and eventually the idea was to counter the, the housing and gentrification issues. So renting spaces that are not um, storefronts, right? So I started from the book cart, we maintained that um, and popped up at farmer's markets and even came down to LA for the LA Women's Writers Con um, Conference. Um, yeah, I remember. yeah, and so that was like, so now we have like four versions of the, the bookmobile on um, foot and bike and, and pallets and, and crates. Um, but then eventually I was able to get a, a, a stairway. So a lot of changes are happening. There's an air, empty stairway with the door entrance. And I asked, can I rent the stairway to create a book store? And they said, well, do you want a storefront? I said, I don't have money to pay for a storefront. So, um, yeah, I rented a stairway for 11 months and popped up in the stairway. Um, and then, then I had to move because construction was going to start. Um, so then they said, well, do you want a storefront now? And I said, no, I still don't have money for a storefront. <laughs> um, so I sell books, you know. I don't sell beer or food. You know? um, so then I got a warehouse in an alley um, with the draw, you know, warehouse store. And we got pushed out of there recently. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to get into those trigger moments. But... <laughs> um, now we actually do have a storefront because we found a landlord that is trying to um, preserve our community rather than sell out. Um, yeah, um, she is the daughter of Korean immigrants um, and Im Korean immigrants that came with nothing and started vending at the one of the last standing Bristol's um, indoor Bristol swap malls in Santa Ana. And because she's the daughter, she's trying to preserve that environment still. Um, and so she offered us rent on subsidized um, mm. rent for us, and as well as making it more cooperative for the community. Mm. So we still pop up and we have a giant little free library inside the food court of the Bristol Swap Mall. We service local little free libraries and we still do mobile events. Um, but on top of that, we now have the actual storefront. Mm. And, wow. and, and our focus is BIPOC. So we Black, Indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ+. Plus, um, you know, minoritized voices in the community um, because there's so much history that we forget. And even though we're 80% Latinx, black folks were actually there um, before us. And there was a black Indeed. Panther chapter there. Um, you know, folks were getting killed, you know, prior to the current issues we're having by police. Um, and we have the largest Vietnamese American population outside of Vietnam that people are, are still unaware of in Garden Grove. Um, and we have Pacific Islanders from Samoa and Tongan and Cambodian folks and, and Little Arabia and Anaheim. So I think like for me, it's also recognizing that just because we're the majority in Santa Ana doesn't mean there's no other um, you know, cultures and backgrounds to yeah. celebrate a, create visibility for. Wow, it's a multi-ethnic. Talk about uh, struggling with red tape. If, if you, you name it, Sarah faced it. <laughs> Still facing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an, an uphill struggle all the time. And how, how having to struggle with red tape ties up with what you are doing in Long Beach? How, how, how do you find the roadblocks within as opposed to the roadblocks outside? Well, we haven't had that issue because we both from the beginning um we've always met in people's backyards that was because we we don't have i mean eventually of course the goal is yes we love a brick and mortar but rents in long beach are ridiculous mm -hmm. um people are getting displaced and so um we've always met either coffee shops that walk us and um, sadly, one of the places we used to meet and do events was Fox Coffee House, and during the pandemic, they closed. Um, there is a new place called the Ripley, uh, Ripley Coffee Shop, and it's a really good mission because they it just it opened a couple of months ago, and they uh, they employ women um, who are coming out of abusive relationships or who are incarcerated. So I really appreciate that mission, um, and so we might be doing some events there. But we're still, um, now that things are opening up, we're going back to the backyard. That's kind of how, <laughs> how we started and it's probably going to be how we how we stay. And during the pandemic, we use Zoom a lot, but 
people have some fatigue now. So um, <laughs> yeah, we are tired. So you know, unfortunately, I mean, we haven't. Luckily, we haven't had that red tape issue, but it's because you know, I follow Sarah on Instagram and other activists, and um, you know, a couple of activists in Highland Park and Long Beach, being kind of like one of the one of the more affordable places. Not anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, so. We're so, that it's not red tape, but it, you are still struggling to to find a place to place right. your like. And you, right, it makes you you mobile and for the other reasons. You know, with these places, we don't want to sit there and camp out. <laughs> 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 because, you know, they need to make money, and um, so back to the fact that you're actually looking to And and what made you join Rapsalum? I was actually uh, invited to take over as a host of Rap to the after I interned there. Um, to be quite honest, I hadn't been looking to take on the, the that spot um, because, because um, I had organized literary events in the past and I knew that if I did it, um, I knew that I would it would change my life. And so I had to make a very big decision. And, um, but, uh, so, and in that case, it was an invitation that um, I did take on very, you know, in a knowing that um, it would be the time that, you know, when, when a door opens, you're, whether you're ready or not, um, if it's something that you have been thinking about, and it had been something I had been thinking about, uh, so then I, I, decided to take that on. Um, the decisions that I had to make was what, how to reinterpret or how to um, envision a space that already had a history. So I took it on after the reading had been run since 2000. And it was um, in the oldest historic building in Santa Monica. And prior to me, it had been run by several different, uh, several different hosts. And because it was situated in, in the west side, um, I had to think very much about how the geographical location of it um, uh, affected who attended what events on the west side. I am I'm from Southeast LA, Huntington Park. Um, my roots are there. Um, I, I have been living in this city. Uh, but my introduction to the literary spaces in Los Angeles when I first graduated, when I was still in college, were um, through the centers like um, self-help graphics and art in East LA, through the world stage, uh, also beyond world. But my experience of these communities, um, also uh, centers in Little Tokyo, but my experience of these literary arts centers was very, um, well, like most things in LA, there's a place and a community for them, but they're really very dispersed um, geographically and economically, um, um, ethnically. And so my idea was, can I create a space that already has its own history that um, can be a center for uh, a space where bilingual writers can come and read their work you know, in any language um, and feel that this is a space for them, where the different communities, different ethnic groups um, can have a space where they felt supported. And I thought really hard about what it meant to create a place that supported minorities, communities of color. Like, what does that mean to celebrate, uh, to celebrate those voices? And so, in shaping the culture of it, um, I took into account a couple of things. Um, one, I began with who I was and where I came from, and um, my family background, as I mentioned, the Hunters of Park. Uh, when I grew up, there were no nonprofits, there were no community centers, but my house um, was an unofficial community center. We had, <laughs> you know, we had we had books, we had we had space, we had. Uh, my mom was always very open to counseling. People would, you know, unofficial counseling the youth in our center. Um, she did that. Um, my grandmother also in in Mexico was. Um, one of the few people who knew how to the, one of the few people to read in her pueblo. She began the unofficial first school in her pueblo, teaching others to read on, on weekends. Um, her mother uh, had uh, during the Mexican Revolution had hosted a punto de partida, which is uh, what uh, arrieros, which is basically 
people, merchants who transport people and goods across Mexico. There were no inns laid. They knew where the points where you could stop to get food and feed their horses. And so this idea of creating a space that was open to the community from large geographic areas and from within the community was something that I began with. So if we're talking about the different culture of the spaces that we have in different spaces, I know no other way, or I do know other ways, but the primary way that I know to create relationships is one at a time. Mm -hmm. And so if you come to the rap saloon, you know, I made invitations today, but one thing that we do is we have, uh, you know, it's part of my, part of my culture to, to create experiences through food before, after, to create experiences, um, you know, in an informal setting. And so uh, I, as much as possible, um, the experience that I chose to, do, that I, that I, the experience I wanted to create was one where you felt acknowledged uh, as an individual, as a writer, um, and that your and you know my goal was that your voice and your experience and who you were as a human being that you felt valued and acknowledged. Mm. And um, the other change that I, the other addition, not change, but the other um, thing that I began to incorporate into the space specifically, um, I did it in an unofficial way, but. In addition to you know making uh, being mindful of featuring uh, diverse uh, diverse features, um, I did this from the beginning in an unofficial way. It was just part and parcel with the way I organized the space. I also, before the pandemic, went in person to different centers, different geographical areas to specifically say this is a space where you can also come on the west side and you're welcome here to make that invitation. Um, when um, when uh, the uprising for racial and social justice happened at the beginning of the pandemic, the other thing that that uh, created a, a specific call that we made was I saw um, Latinx uh, uh, protesters in the Black Lives Matters Black Lives uh, holding signs that said Latinx for uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, and so. Um, and I thought a lot about, you know, what role, we have this conversation lots as writers, right? What role do I as a writer, do I as a poet have mm -hmm. in creating change? And um, so I began, uh, you know, we were, we were in quarantine. I began with what I had, with the platform I had, and I made a call for, uh, for the poets to come and uh, share a poem or an excerpt by a black author in addition to sharing their work. And um, this, uh, and so it, the idea is simply, you know, how can we use our platform, whether you have four minutes, in, you know, an open mic or 15 minutes or a reading series or a space to number one, acknowledge the lineage that, uh, and the lineage and the community of other writers that have come before you and that you share. Mm. Um, and that opens up conversations of, uh, you know, incorporating historical voices, contemporary voices, and all of the incredible community, um, uh, all of the incredible activism that as literary artists and as community members, poets are already doing. Mm -hmm. So just opening up that one uh, very specific verbal, uh, making that very specific verbal acknowledgement and invitation um, is uh, really opens the space I, ha I have found to, um, uh, further those avenues and opportunities for change and for partnership that we are already doing as writers. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica? Yeah, and I just I wanted to share this with you. you like that's one of the from the uprising. It's one of the banners. Um, this one says Latinos against police brutality and systematic racism because Black Lives Matter Rest in peace to the fallen brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Elisha. Yep. Yeah. Elisha. Uh, Sophie then took it. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the original question, what caught, what, what was the reason for creating the Quote Society was, well, I was out of my grad program um, in a, a program where you have, you know, visit, you have visiting poets all the time and readings and wine and cheese mm -hmm. and more wine and cheese and grapes and, oh my gosh, I love it. I love it. I just, I, um, 
I, I love meeting other creatives and the network and just also to learn and grow, you know, from each other and share. Um, so that experience after I graduated, it's like that experience ended, you know, and when I, so I felt myself, you know, I'm a poet in Los Angeles. So where are the poets at? <laughs> where can I go for poetry? Where can I share? Where can I meet others? Where are the artists at? Where are the musicians at? Where are y'all artists at? So it was, it was a, a need that I have where I didn't want to be alone. I wanted to find creative community. And ironically, gosh, you know, ironically, Otis College is literally like a 10 minute drive from beyond the rope, a hub of creativity, a hub for the spoken word, all that. I'm like, why did they not marry us back then? Why did I not know about this? You know, because beyond the rope is 50 plus old, years old. And um, I don't know why there wasn't a relationship there. But nevertheless, um, I was seeking out for other artists and other poets. Um, and when I was in my undergrad um, uh, at UC Riverside, they have Writers Week. Um, that's a writing series, a week-long writing series hosted by the creative writing department. Another big, I love parties. I'm party girl nerd. I love, uh, I'm like, I'm all about that. <laughs> all about that. Uh, but yeah, it was a week-long party. Writers all from all over California and the, you know, further away, you know, from the, any distance and, you know, invited to, to join us and be a part, experience our culture there, right? The UC Riverside culture and, and, but to share a piece of themselves with us and, and writers of poets and nonfiction and, you know, all the different genres. And it was so exciting. Like that's where I really saw literary parties, literary networking, and just, you know, being a fly on the wall, listening to all this, some of these amazing uh, academics and, and writers and thinkers. And I was just like, oh, and um, I was uh, an editor for the literary journal for uh, Mosaic Art Literary Magazine back in the day. Um, and we, we also uh, worked with uh, the different authors, right, in, in extending the invitation to join us for this event. And so I kind of got my feet wet there. Um, I love how, like I said, I love parties. Um, it's been a while since I've had my own party. But uh, I, I just enjoy it. I love seeing, like what you were saying, I love to see folks smiling, having a good time, people being happy. I love bringing people together. Um, so I like Poet Society literally right after, you know, like months after I graduated, you know, I'm just like, oh, where are the poets at? And I would look online and I would look and, you know, just different anthologies and poets and writers and remember the writer's market you guys remember that those you know the writer's market guys the man i would look through all those listings and be like okay do these still exist and the web wasn't very cool it wasn't you know as fine-tuned as it is now and, and uh you know so much detail and sometimes you go to a website and it's like uh not found you know? so i would be putting pieces together and well anyhow i had the idea well, surely there's a, a Los Angeles Poet Society. So I had heard about Poetry Society, Poet Society. And I'm like, I know there's the Poetry Academy or the, the uh, yeah. Academy of Poets. Yeah, the Academy of Poets, right, yeah. So I was like, surely, I mean, Los Angeles is huge, Metro. Where's, you know, Los Angeles Poet Society. Let me check, let's see if this website exists. Let me check to see if this exists and I'll have a whole listing of open mics I can go to, right? It didn't exist. Los, uh, Los Angeles, Los Angeles did not have a poet society. And I was like, so surprised. I was like, really? They didn't? And um, and I am a proud LA girl, I'm, you know, born in East LA, East Coast. <laughs> so I'm like, my gift to Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Poet Society. So I'm like, I'm gonna start it. I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna do it. And um, back then I was, thank you. Yeah, back then I was, uh, what was I? I graduated. I think I was 26 or something like that, 27. But I was nervous. I was not in the scene. I didn't know anybody other than my classmates. You know, I, I wasn't really, I didn't know anybody. And other than the, the you know, the poets that are published by the, the top three publishers, you know, the, you know, I'm saying like the, the ones on the, the, the poets.org or, you know, <laughs> The, those folks. Those folks. Yeah, like I would, you know, anyhow. <laughs> so I'm like, hmm? where did I go? I have to go somewhere far to go see a poet. Um, well, I did hear about the Redondo Beach poets, right, at Coffee Cartel that they would meet on Tuesdays. 
And that was actually the first stuff with my career too. And they were all, they were all a little bit, you know, I, I was a different generation, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I was, I'm like, I'm really, like, I love the internet. The internet, like, I, I have my own so you have different generation. Like, starting for me making my own magazines when I was in, in junior high or middle school. And then, you know, uh, I was um, on newspaper in high school and layout and all that. So for me, um, the internet was it just a, like a magazine online, you know, it's a newspaper online. I'm like, whoa. So I started making websites and building that stuff. And that's like, I, I actually put the UC Riverside uh, Literary Journal Mosaic online for the first time ever. So I started that. And um, well, nevertheless, so I was all into the whole web thing and, you know, and I wanted to connect with others and all that, the creatives. So what I did was, is, uh, uh, I forgot what the social media was then, but I had little strips of paper, kind of like when you have, you know, uh, hey, I need a babysitter one, and they have strips of like the phone number. <laughs> so I had like, I had something like that that just said strips like, join the Los Angeles Poet Society, you know, send me an email, uh, blah, 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 whatever email it was. I think it was Venice Soapbox Poets or something at Gmail. And I really started getting more traction on Twitter back in the back. But anyway, I remember going there. No one ever knew about LA Post site because it was never uttered into the university. And <laughs> my little strips of paper. And I think it was Larry Culper was the host, the rest of the rest of power brother. Um, but I remember, you know, meeting him and meeting the other poets that were there, you know, older white poets, I guess they were. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, you know, and I did my my time, I was nervous, and like they all read and stuff. And then at the end, you know, kind of like meeting every time, like, hey, you guys should join us. <laughs> you know, I'm getting the paper. Here, yeah, join the Los Angeles website. Just send your email here. You know? <laughs> it was something so clandestine. <laughs> emails. It's like that's how it started. Collecting emails, and I have this like long. Well, it all started with a mailing list. And I remember Larry looking at me like, "Huh, I don't know about the Los Angeles." Uh, you know, <laughs> and I was like, "No, well, why?" Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like it exists because I say it exists. Exactly. You know? exactly. But it's not me. It's all of us. And I, I do message that every time I'm reading, like. It's all of you that make the LA poets. Yeah. And it wouldn't be 13 years without all of you. Aww. And um, so that's, yeah. So that was the first utterance of Los Angeles Poet Society. And like you mentioned, Lisbeth, you know, our first ever event or action that was my friend Christina Granados and I, who she's also a writer. And we were working actually for McGraw Hill, which was a dream at, back then. I was like, Oh, hello. My, my textbook publishing. <laughs> Christina, I don't know if she's from that. Maybe. I haven't talked to her in a while. Been long, long time. But, but she gave me that strength. You know, you kind of need, you need the road dog. You know, when you have someone behind you, it's a little bit, yes. you have more courage. You have to support each other. Being on Venice Beach Boardwalk alone, <laughs> not easy, man. Oh my God. Putting it down on the square, being like, this is my space. It's just, you know, just this is a box. You know, but hey guys, come up, come over, come over, share your truth, come on, step up on the bus and share your truth. And um, yeah, that's how we that's how we started. And November, so which I love saying, we were on the beach in November. And it was sunny, and like only Los Angeles. You know? Um, it was awesome. It was awesome. And I also got the idea of the box because I, I would always go to Venice Beach or go go to the boardwalk. It's been a long time since I've been there now, but there was a, a guy that had a big crowd around. Him. And he was standing on top of an ice chest, you know, and, and you know, so there's a crowd and like, oh, what's going on? I want to hear, I want to hear. What's going on? What's this guy at? And he's holding up something like this. Oh, and I'm like, oh, cool. And I got excited. I got closer. Blah, blah, blah. Jesus, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, like, oh. uh, and I walked away. So, no offense. You know, but you got the box. It wasn't my thing. But I was like, hey. If that guy can just stand up there shouting stuff out, why can't a poet? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's where it all that's, that's how it all began. And great. Just kept doing it. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So so you all have touched in the the challenges of starting something and the beauty of starting something and how you have had your 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 community. I'm gonna touch in an uh, at an I'm gonna touch on an uncomfortable topic. To discuss and um, my generation was taught that uh, we should approach money like menstruation it's dirty and it's private but uh, 
not for me. <laughs> so um, I welcome menstruation poems as much as I welcome conversations about money. I think money is dirty, but I don't think it's intimate. And after all, you pull up your wallet in public to pay for groceries. So you don't have to hide anywhere to pay for the groceries. You do it in public. So there is a growing trend uh, among poets and artists in general to resist performing for free, right? And um, I, at least I would like to believe that it's a growing trend. Right. What do you have to say about that? Is it already happening? How has it impacted your ability to recruit features for your for your events? And um, how is it working for us? And I like to remind uh, everybody that we are we are getting short of time now, so we're beginning that question and another one. And, and okay, so let's let's talk about money. I'll go first because I <laughs> go first. <laughs> so I got something to say. Things, so the polite, people can say the polite thing. <laughs> um, you know, I it's it's a part of it is that people don't realize how much when they do something for free, especially in someone's community, what they take away from the local artists, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that happens so much. I mean, the biggest fight I have in Santa Ana is against Boca de Oro, <laughs> which I know a lot of artists still participate in, but they stream a lot of information and it's used to gentrify our community. It's used to create a platform for the Santa Business Council, for the Arts Conservatory that they're trying to raise money for, which is part of the Santa Unified School District, instead of investing in local artists there. They'll pay other people, but they won't pay local artists. The first five years, they never invited a local artist. Mm. So, and, um, and, the, and for the first three years, we fought against it. I even quit working with them because they refused to pay. I gave them all the poets and writers information. I gave them, say, even if it's $25, give them $25 for gas, $25 to pay for the tacos that they're gonna eat after this because you're not gonna feed them. You know, like, but the problem is that there's still people doing stuff for free and no one's visiting the communities to ask the artists, what are they doing for you if they're inviting mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. right? And that's the biggest fight I have. Uh, because I'm a writer and I've been published, I do have the privilege of knowing the resources, right? We like poets and writers. Yeah. So I always teach folks, like advocate for yourself. You tell them how easy the form is. You teach them. You tell them that you, you'll, you know, like you want to do the event and you want to do it for them. But the moment that you accept something for free, you're also minimizing the person that comes exactly, after you. Exactly. And that is the biggest battle I have in my community because they're fighting for $100. For $100. They're fighting for $25. When we should be getting paid, that the state rate for artists for minimum is $60 an hour. Wow. That's from the California Arts Council. The state rate is $60 an hour. And my thing is like, there are events where you can say, I'm choosing to do this for free. I do it all the time. I am choosing to do this for free because of the cause, because of the audience. Yeah. Um, but it's your choice. But it's my choice, exactly. you know? And I think that's where we all have to work and together to communicate, you know? So many people have said, hey, bring Libra Mobile to East LA. Hey, bring Libra Mobile to San Francisco. And I say, no, let me give you resources in your community that you should be calling first. Because mm. we all have to do our homework. Yeah, and, love, oh, okay. and you talk about poets and writers, and I think this is the perfect moment to plug in a <laughs> www.pw.org, poets and writer. And, and you go to the reading, reading resources. The reading tab, and you will find a find a sources of funding, and they they fund events like this. And I would like to transition my career into becoming a, a community organizer and event organizer. And I have pledged to myself I will not call anybody if I don't have the ability to pay somebody. I remember it was James Coates telling me the other day he was invited to um, 
um, uh, it was a fashion show. And then he was invited to read, to open the show with poetry. And they were paying the musicians, they were paying the models, they were paying the catering. And they didn't offer him any money. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, and they said, why would you believe that the poet works for free? How has it affected you and your way to, 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 to a, a recruit features for your, for your, for your events if you cannot pay? I can speak to that. Um, there's an organization I, I work with very closely and one of my colleagues had that issue because I wanted to take on the reading series and instead I would use a book from poets and writers and I like all of us to read and she raised objections and she's like, well, as long as you don't get paid. I'm like, for me, it's a grant money from poets and writers. Well, I make my money doing business and everything. I have a full-time job. I'm really well paid. I'm not doing this for, <laughs> for the, you know, they love of it. Of that. <laughs> That I would get. I would, I just agree when um, I make a film, I pay people, and I don't pay people $50. I, pay, I mean, it's hard work when you're on set for 12 hours a day and someone offers you $100. That's like ridiculous. And so, if you, my thing is, if you can't pay labor, don't do it. Mm -hmm. And I really stand by that. Yes. I mean, there's also reciprocity, right? Like that's why I have a bookstore so that I can sell books and put money back into the community to the artists, right? So even sometimes all I say is I have $25, right? And some people, they can choose. And I, and I say, I understand that that's not enough. Um, but the other thing is like there's reciprocity, right? Like if Lucy asked me to come and do something with her, I would do it because she would invest time in me, right? Um, I'm not going to promise her a lineup of people. I would say, Lucy, I can do it, but I can't ask somebody else to do it for free. You know, and I think that's the combination of things that we all should talk about. It's, you know, and it, and it does become a thing like, well, if an institution is going to ask me, that's this money. But if you're going to ask me, that's this money. You know? mm -hmm. One of the things, um, one of the things that wraps the dream series um, has for me as when I when I took it over, um, this idea of reciprocity uh, was important. I didn't know how to approach this because there is no specific budget for the reading series. Essentially, the way because it's a historic building, a historic building is owned by the uh, the business that is around the area, and so um, they agreed to um, make it free for us to use. Um, as part of the creative community, but for everybody else that uses the space, they charge to rent the space because technically they own it. Mm -hmm. They agreed to preserve the building and not demolish it, and they just built around it. And so I came into this contract. And so um, while other spaces can charge entry fee, right? Like for example, if you go to an open mic, it might be donations only. Mm -hmm. And then you could, you have the ability to pool that and at least, uh -huh. you know, give $45, 50 and things like that to the open mic. Um, when I inquired, you know, whether we're able to do that, because that, that seemed, you know, like a, a, like an option for those who could, who could donate it, you know, that was one model when I was figuring out. They specifically said, if you start charging um, entrance fees, then we have to charge you rent. Um, and I inquired, well, how much is it to rent it for X, you know, for the five hours? And it is I, it, it prohibited. It, it would be <laughs> just phenomenally expensive per hour, right? Wow. And so this now this is an international um, uh, this is an international business. And um, so my initial idea uh, you know, I, I won't get into like the dynamics of you know who to contact to be in charge, that's another conversation. But my initial idea was this idea of reciprocity, right? So if I was going to build a community, I thought, well, is there something that I can offer in lieu of an honoraria? And, and when I first started it, the first um, year or two, I offered um, my art as, an, as a form of honoraria, like a photo session, because um, I did photography, uh, a photo session, a one-hour photo session, or a charcoal portrait, right? 
And um, and so that was one of the options that I that I chose to give. However, and I did do um, in the beginning, you know, I, I was able to do that artist, you know, the far away. Uh, but the more they accumulated, then it was unsustainable for me to do. Right? Mm -hmm. So while that while I was very much aware of like you know how how to how to compensate that time, uh, I tried that. That was you know that was not working. Um, one thing, so you know we we don't charge entrance fee, but we also don't take any, for example, percentage of any of the book sales or anything like that. Um, but the, the one thing that we did start doing during the pandemic was make a call for artist donations, which we hadn't done before, but specifically because in the pandemic, you know, everybody, so, so many, the pandemic affected everyone in different ways financially. And um, so that's one thing that we began doing, but we have been running virtually for the past two years. And so the question that now I'm, that I'm literally in the middle of right now is as we go back to person and we're having more of these more and more of these conversations right um how are we going to transition that model and negotiate with the landowners um to yeah figure out that financial situation so that we can provide for because it's been it's sort of been in this no man's land right because there's no way we can afford to pay the hourly fee if that's if that's what it is so um many changes are going to happen once we go back in person one is going to be hybrid as in you know virtual zooming as well as in person specifically to bridge the different ge geographical areas and two uh yeah what about this question that we have sort of been locked into to not be able to um so it, the, the answer might be partner with uh do more grant writing you know uh but then the other question is you know this is something that I do on a volunteer basis. I, I recognize that my privilege as someone who's employed, you know, in education, I have the, I do have that privilege to volunteer my time, right? I don't get compensation for, um, for, for uh, doing this, these events. Um, and so then the question is, how do I, uh, you know, how do then, I scale this project so that there's um, so that I am able to, if need be, write more grants, partner with find a partnering organization. So that is a big change that hasn't happened in the two since the reading series has been going on since 2000. And and let me clarify something here because I want it to look like it is a grand and and when you you hear the word grand writing it's it. It looks daunting. This these kind of funding is not daunting. No. It, 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 it's actually a pretty easy, straightforward process, but you need a fiscal sponsor. So I cannot write a grant for Lisbeth Poyman to do this kind of event. I have to find a fiscal sponsor beyond Baroque to do it. To, to to just that, to be the fiscal sponsor. But for poets and writers, you don't need a fiscal sponsor. I cannot write it for Elizabeth Coyman. No, you cannot. But you can use it for Rap Saloon. Yeah. yeah, but you can do it for Rap Saloon. If you have the reading series, if you have the event, if you have, and you have like five different reading series, you can write to the fiscal sponsor and they pay you or they pay the the the, the features right so the the but there are many other ways to find and you are diminishing what you do because you offer the opportunity to sell books if you go to a to a library the library doesn't allow you to sell books so that's a source of income and and another idea would be if you it say, well, you cannot pass the hat, but you can pass a virtual hat. And it doesn't have to have a physical address, right? So when you come to this situation where you become hybrid, say, okay, we are not putting a hat in the middle of the other day, but you can pass the virtual hat and people can still, and the ability, I welcome the ability to sell my books. No matter what, I went to the last open mic I was, I was the last in the open mic, and I had one poem left, 
because every, people spoke too much and there wasn't much time. So I had one poem to read and say, I have one poem to convince you to buy this book. And I read my poem and I sold six books. And so I, I, the ability to sell your books is a way of compensation. Yeah. So for me, uh, I welcome that. But I am kind of a, how do you say when, when you are too aggressive. No, not aggressive. I think I'm assertive in, in, in what I do because, it, well, I'm 57 years old and I'm not romantic. <laughs> and and I, that idea of the starving artist doesn't sit well with me. Uh, I, I don't want to get into ideologies or anything like that, but I need my money. I need to pay rent and I don't like to go with one hand in the back and one hand in the front. No, no, no. I have to have a decent life and this is a profession as, as, as honorable and as deserving of wealth as any other. And I don't have to diminish myself. I always say, I always tell people when they offer me free exposure, I love that. I, 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 all of you that know me know I'm black. I know the only free exposure that I do is taking my clothes off. <laughs> yeah, I'm 47 years old. My years of free exposure ended at Monte Carlo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank don't be shy and saying, I have this book, you know, and I'm proud of it. And I don't care if it's 10 years old, like be support, you know, advocate for yourself so that, you know, because sometimes we're like, oh yeah, you know, what's the, what's your Venmo or what's your PayPal, you know, we'll, we'll mention all that, but nobody, you know, some folks get very like quiet or shy, like, oh yeah, if you want to. It's like, advocate, <laughs> don't, don't hide your book. Or, it's such an honor to be published, especially if you have your own book all to yourself, because that takes money to publish folks. You know, especially color, it takes a lot of money. But um, you got, you know, it's like authors, you know, stand by, stand by your writing, stand by your art, you know, you're, you are worth it, you know. So I, I just definitely recommend, uh, there's so many shy artists, and, and I know sometimes creating is introverted, but right? you're individual, but you need to advocate as well, also for yourself. And um, I think that's great. You have, I have, you know, one point of view, but that's beautiful. I love that. <laughs> Try that out, y'all. Try that out. <laughs> I, think the, I, think, I think one of the you know, larger conversations that we're having in the literary community um, and also just in the other in the other disciplines is um, there, there, I guess there are two separate but two questions, the same question, but how to apply to different spaces. So one, how do you change the system within institutions that have already been there when we came into them? Mm -hmm. And two, how do you create change um, from, you know, uh, uh, on the molecular level when we create our own projects and are able to create those goals for ourselves and, you know, uh, um, scale the project that way? And, there, and um, you know, and I have different projects and the answer to one is you know clear like the love on demand global project that evolves differently right um than than the reading series and uh you know on the uh i have these conversations with other writers often right where should we where, where should we be focusing our energy should you know because it's so much uh, it's sort of a false choice because you know it's not either or um we have to find those those answers and create new avenues. You know, even things like featuring diverse, uh, uh, bringing in uh, diverse uh, features, right? Mm -hmm. um, before the pandemic, nobody, only one feature asked, will I be the only white feature? Will, will I be the only white feature? Um, will there be other writers of color will I, I will not feature on an all white panel. Like they only in the three years that I hosted it before the pandemic, right? And there were also the conversations about how funding worked. And so these are, um, so as we sort of, uh, as we develop our own communities, you know, within institutions and our, as we build them, these are questions that in real time, 
you know, I have been I have been figuring out how to just bring that into the conversation from the center, right? Both of those things. And so yeah, these are ongoing conversations that uh, I I hear other writers because most writers I know are also doing incredible work in the community. And they're they they're very urgent questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll say something quickly. Uh, for me, coming from like media and marketing, what I'm doing now with, like you say, the baby uh, publishing division of Alegria is that I have the privilege to, to have this company that has given me a lot of opportunities and access. Um, so therefore, I'm now figuring out the way that I can bring, let's say, if I work with like big brands in the past, how I can bring, you know, because, you know, storytelling is such a big part of marketing. So how do I get, you know, to give them visibility through these brands, you know, and hopefully, you know how it is. I, I it's, it's hard, still hard, um, because their budgets, when it's for people of color, certain ethnicities, you know, it's like, oh, we only have this, but, you know, you know, their budgets for mainstream is like millions of dollars. So, I've had to also kind of like set my foot down and be like, is this respectful? Sometimes when these big brands mm -hmm. want to um, sponsor something in the Latinx space, when you know the funds that they have. Um, so you have to be careful with that. But for me, for my community and, and the writers that I mentor and that are starting out, for me, it's like, I feel that it's really important to, for them to think, in terms also, like you said, like value their art and also think of being creative entrepreneurs. I think that's the economy we're in. So I really advocate for them to put themselves out there, um, whether we like it or not, social media is, is a very powerful tool, you know, and it also gives you access to be in contact with people that can potentially hire you. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, just being kind of like that serial entrepreneur that I am, I'm very um, involved in giving access to these like new generations of writers that maybe don't have big platforms or anything like that. So like we have our 10 year anniversary on the 20th at the last bookstore, I'll plug that in. <laughs> um, I think, like, they all, all can sell their books. Um, they keep all of their profit and stuff like that. So they just put themselves out there. Um, but I do try to teach them that, you know, we are our, own best advocates you exactly know? and the way you treat yourself as an artist and entrepreneur that's the way people will value you exactly. so if they know they can always get you for free yeah. they will yeah. you know exactly. but the moment you're like no thank you you know what's the budget you know mm -hmm. what's the budget is there anything and then and of course if it's something that you know is for a good cause or something like that absolutely but when it's people like come on, you know, they're huge organizations or brands. No, that's very disrespectful, you know? Exactly, so exactly, like exactly. Yeah, it all depends. We, it's, there is always common sense there. Yeah, if you, you, you know, you, and you have to be humble yeah. and, and know where you are and read your room and say, you can ask money or you cannot. But yeah, if you can pay, I'm going to ask for money. And for sure, I, I want to change topics to 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 end and 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 bring the conversation to a wrap in a fun way. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think of that one feature that you dream of having in your in your series. You already have it. I mean, I'm, it's in the works, so I don't know. Oh, primicia. <laughs> primicia. So, yeah, I don't know. How do you say primicia? How do you say primicia? Premier? No, um, then like a like a first time you're going to say something. You're going to no. break, breaking news, breaking news, breaking news. I'm not going to say anything. So okay. Like, oh. But I think for me, it's... Um, it's not it's not about fame or who, who has a book. It's more about... Like, I want to see my gente who feel like they they can come in and share their words in Spanish or in Vietnamese, um, you know, or, you know, any young person of color who finds home in my bookstore. Great. Um, and that to me is more important. Great. Nice answer. Go ahead. I just asked someone in the audience earlier, like, you know, let me know if you're teaching a flash fiction. <laughs> 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 of course, it's like, 
oh, why don't you let me do it through Long Beach? I'm like, yeah, Long Beach Literary Arts Center. Okay, yeah, we'll make that happen. So, Reina Grande? No, no, she's here in the audience. But she, ah. Oh. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I thought you were not saying my name on purpose. Well, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, 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 so there, there's my dream. Oh, <laughs> Jessica. Well, I've been doing this for a while, so I can't say I have a dream. Uh, I love, but I love like the city. Of, I'm all about building the diversity. I love like grabbing people from different neighborhoods and every, you know, everywhere. And just let's have a big part. Um, for, I think for me to be more like a dream venue or like have a, mm. a, a residency a Los Angeles close to like space something like that oh. to really like have more um just uh, more creative ways to feature people and, mm. um, and also radio and actually that's more accessible yeah that's what I, that's what I dream of I dream of radio <laughs> yeah so I'm excited about that we're starting May 1st actually we're gonna have our first radio feature Uh, and okay. Olin means movement. Olin is an uh, uh, so movement. Uh, so we're really excited. KR and yeah, Good. Nice. Great. We manifest, manifest, yes, sister. Manifest. <laughs> Cynthia. Um, I, I, envision a, I envision a space and an opportunity to bring in um, writers who write on paper on the screen on Instagram, but also writers, creatives um, who compose without text. So our parents, our uncles, our aunts, our grandmothers, um, because I'm very much aware that in my training, um, what is considered, you know, when I get asked the question, you know, who are your favorite authors? I understand that they're asking me, you know, what are the names of creatives who express their ideas through text and the written form. But the answer to that um, does not necessarily include all of the oral history that shaped me, you know, um, the language that shaped me. And so, and a lot of them did not, most of them did not participate in these academic literary institutions, but they're equally artful, poetic, mm -hmm. and very present in my language and mindset. So I would love on a regular basis to have, you know, um, the, the literary, in terms of, you know, uh, written text writers alongside um, uh, the oral historians, the, the poetry that's transmitted orally and orally, um, as well as uh, members from, you know, our local nonprofits mm -hmm. uh, and to be in conversation because there's a lot of um, inter interdisciplinary conversations that already happen in our literary spheres. Mm -hmm. That's, that's something I'm beginning to do with the Love on Demand Global Project. Uh, one, what that is briefly is we set up a poetry booth. We started at Santa Monica's Promenade. And as a matter of fact, it took like six months to get a permit because we weren't, I, I went to, they sent me to the city hall, police station, like all, we weren't performers, we weren't vendors, we, uh, you know. Just a like typewriter. They, I was like, all we want to do is write poems. And they're like, you don't fit the list. There's no reason this. And I'm like, so anyway, um, but we initially, it was this academic creative exercise. Then we incorporated fund fundraising for nonprofits. And so we specifically asked for donations but through poetry. Part of it goes to the poets, part of it goes to the nonprofit. And so there's already that conversation with uh, the local and national nonprofits uh, through creative experiences. So there's so many, so much overlap with uh, the, the creative and local uh, and community development um, uh, conversations. So that's sort of a big word cloud of the of my dream featured <laughs> conversation. <laughs> yeah, Davina. Um, I'm manifesting a bigger new band because <laughs> I envision, I always say, the type of poets I met through the bookstore, normal people, everyday people, like I want to discover all those poets that have not written their books, that are like brilliant, but I'm better than anything that you would probably see in mainstream, but that then maybe, you know, they never believe in their art or something like that. 
So I need to manifest a new event so I can do like a five stage um, type of road trip. With <laughs> uh, but my old band will only make it, uh, maybe stop being as far as San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, manifesting that because I think, um, you know, there is just so many gems out there. The moment that you open a space, a safe space for people to express um, themselves and their soul, I think there's just so much magic out there. Yes. You know? yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, we have come to the end of the event and I am extremely grateful to all of you for taking time from your many options that you have or entertainment on a Friday evening in Los Angeles to come and listen to us speak about poetry, community, and all things that we love in art. And so for that, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to Beyond Baroque for setting my crazy proposals that I started sending you. I have sent like four different proposals since since October. Since October, I started sending proposals to, to be on Baroque. So there is more to come, guys. Um, listening to me and, and being willing to, to, to understand what I was trying to do. And uh, to you, I am more than grateful, not just because you have welcomed me in your communities and you have offered me a platform to communicate my words, but also because most of you have offered me also a friendship that I so much value. You all know that I'm alone here in this in this state and most of the country, I only have two people in the country close to King. And I highly value my community and how people have received me through you in your communities. Uh, it's something that I really, really cherish. And this is just one small way I have to pay tribute to you and all those that have offered me a home. Thank you very much. Thank you.